going from um, talking about uh, you know next steps for commercialization in low Earth orbit, we're going to talk about some of the successes that we've seen in low Earth orbit uh, through uh, uh, science done on the space station. Um, and so with us today, uh, we have a, a great set of folks. Um, and our moderator for this session is uh, not only the moderator, but uh, our planning committee chair for this event, uh, Michelle Thaler. Uh, and she is science communication strategist at uh, the NASA Goddard Space, Space Flight Center. Um, and so while they're getting set up, um, we'll make sure everything's all set and she's going to give them a little briefing. Um, and by the way, if we haven't met, I'm Jim Way. Um, quick show of hands. Uh, who, who all was here yes, or who all is here today for the first time? Like wasn't here yesterday. Okay, we got a couple. All right. Well, good to have you here. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Welcome, Mary. Welcome to this, uh, this extraordinary panel. I, uh, I think that you know a lot of people are unaware of some of the amazing science results uh, that the uh, International Space Station has made possible. And uh, I've actually been, a, uh, before I introduce a, a Keith here, I'm going to give you a little bit of an astronomy lesson because he studies some of the most fascinating things in the universe called neutron stars from the space station. And uh, we have a, a really wonderful panel. Uh, we're going to begin with, uh, with Ray Lugo, who is somebody that is well known in NASA circles. Of course, Ray was the director of the Gun Research Center. And, and now he's the president and CEO of ISS National Maps. So it's a really interesting uh, a new way to look at the International Space Station as a national laboratory. So I uh, believe what we'll do is we'll go, um, we, this is a relatively short panel. We've only got 45 minutes. So I will give each of the speakers roughly 10 minutes to speak. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll hopefully leave the rest for questions. And then we'll go on to our, our, our Goddard speaker, Antonella Nota, after this. So we've got some wonderful things for you coming up this morning. So uh, if I could, Ray, uh, please go ahead and begin. Uh, do you have Ray's slides, slides queued or? <laughs> So we've got nicer. We see we see that, and uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, we can start with nicer, and uh, and that way uh, that way we have we've got the slides ready to go. So let's uh, do that. Um, for those of you up in the AV booth, um, is, is that all right? If we will start with nicer and then go right after that. Oh, there I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, we have a slides. Yeah. test. Okay. Well, good morning. So before I, I start my slides, I want to just uh, recount a little story of my last time at the Goddard Memorial Symposium it was about 11 years ago. And I was on a panel with um, four other deputy center directors, and I elected to go last. And as I expected, one of my colleagues basically consumed all the oxygen in the room, so I never got to make any remarks. So they put me on first. I don't know if it was intentional, but uh, I'm, unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to me for a few minutes. Uh, next, let well, me go to the next slide. Okay. So the ISS National Lab, and if you aren't fully aware of it, um, there's actually somebody in this room that was somewhat responsible for the, for the formation of the National Lab uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and in that time, we've flown about 500 payloads. So starting from a, a dead zero stop, we, um, we've flown 500 payloads. Um, we've raised about $394 million of post-award financing for our partners. Um, we created incredible infrastructure, uh, and I think uh, we're well positioned 
uh, first to uh, fly out the remaining life of the ISS, but hopefully um, to uh, move into the um, commercial Leo uh, uh, version of the National Lab. So here's uh, just a chart to show you some of the um, uh, uh, funding we bring in from other government agencies. Um, that was part of our charter was to um, work with other government agencies to bring additional research funding into the ISS. So we have uh, very strong collaborations and partnerships with NSF, uh, the NIH, um, and um, I would, I would share with you, we're working on a potential collaboration with the Department of Energy, all focused on utilizing the unique platform of microgravity to uh, improve life here on Earth. So a few things that we are working on that I'm particularly um, excited about. Um, if you're not aware of the tissue chips um, research that we're doing on ISS, um, this basically is um, at, a, at a cell level. Um, uh, experiments that are being done to characterize um, different kinds of, uh, um, what's the right term to use? Basically, to allow us to predict disease models um, on, on a micro scale. And so this research is particularly interesting because hopefully we're able to actually do um, a lot of uh, drug testing and understanding how the disease progresses without the use of animals. So I, I think this is a particularly um, exciting uh, line of research. Um, stem cells, again, another area where we and the microgravity world offer a, um, a unique capability. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, uh, stem cells across the research community. Things like um, uh, regenerative medicine, um, uh, and more importantly, stem, stem cell treatments of um, you know chronic diseases. And um, the good thing about the ISS, we're able to grow um, large populations of high quality stem cells that really enable a lot of research here on Earth. Uh, genes in space. Um, what we're hoping to do is um, understand using, uh, I think most of you have heard of CRISPR, um, how we can potentially modify the genome uh, in space and potentially cure, uh, cure or offer um, uh, some uh, clinical um, treatments for uh, genetic diseases. And then uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of our most um, uh, exciting areas of research on, on ISS right now, which is the in-space production uh, area, which is mostly focused on medical applications and materials. Um, we're just completing two uh, solicitations. One we did jointly with NASA, which was the very first time we've done it. Um, previously, NASA had done the selections themselves. We're using our peer review process, and then we jointly select um, what we consider the best science projects for funding. And then finally, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our upcoming ISS RDC. Um, it's in July, it's here in Washington, DC. Um, it's a really good opportunity to uh, meet people uh, that are working on um, both research on the ISS and obviously a lot of our commercial partners, including um, most of the commercial Leo destination partners will be in attendance. So we're really excited about that and uh, look forward to seeing you there. So have a good day. Very much. Is the is the cold atom facility? Is that part of the uh, National Lab Studio? Is that, yeah, yeah, because it's different, right? Yeah, that's that's some of those facilities, like we own AMS, but we don't own very many of the other NASA. Got it. Got it. All right. All right. All right. Um, so our next speaker, uh, Keith Gendro, is the principal investigator for the NICER mission. The NICER stands for the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. And uh, this is some of the most exciting fundamental physics that I have seen NASA do in this decade. And uh, I, I must say that uh, this is it's always a pleasure to sit next to, to Keith. Uh, Keith was just, Keith and his team were just recently the recipient of something called the, Ro the Rossi Prize, which there's, a, there's another AAS, the American Astronomical Society, and this is the most prestigious prize given for high energy astronomy. Now, um, because we have many people here from the aerospace industry who may not know specifically about neutron stars, I asked Keith if I could give a, a little bit of an intro and he'll, uh, he'll, he'll keep me honest here. So, um, 
A lot of people are familiar with supernova explosions that massive stars end their lives violently and they explode. And this happens when the core of the star no longer has very efficient nuclear reactions going on. And all of a sudden, the, the outward pressure of those nuclear reactions goes away. The star then collapses under the force of gravity. And amazingly, the core becomes this very super dense material that we'll talk about today. Uh, the reason the star explodes is that the rest of the star is still falling down onto this very, very compressed core. And there are shock waves that, that go out and actually rip the star apart. And that's a supernova explosion. But in the middle of this, there is this collapsed stellar core. And the most extreme form this can take is the one that we're all familiar with called the black hole. And in the case of a black hole, the gravity, the density is so extreme that the gravity actually creates an event horizon, not even light can escape. But a neutron star is basically matter right at that edge, sitting on that edge just before it collapses out of reality. And I've been to some of the, uh, the branch seminars and, and, and talks that Keith has given. And uh, it was kind of funny because people say the public all knows about black holes, but neutron stars are even more exciting because they're actually there, you can observe them. To give you an idea how extreme these objects are, uh, you normally have about two times the mass of the sun packed into a ball about 20 kilometers across. And from the angular momentum of this collapse and also being spun up by different mechanisms, uh, these things can often spin hundreds of times a second. And they are a million degree hot. And uh, some of them, I think Keith may talk about some recent results, some of them have extreme magnetic fields. These are called magnetars. And uh, you think about a strong uh, magnet at a science museum that kids are playing with, making little metal bead bridges and all of that. That may be a, a one Gauss magnet. That's the, that's the unit we use, Gauss. Some of these magnetars have uh, magnetic fields of 10 to the 16th Gauss. Yeah, one with 16 zeros Gauss. And I think I was actually in your laboratory one time when you said that just the, the magnetic energy of these objects, when you think about energy equals mass times the speed of light squared equals mc squared. Just the magnetic field means the vacuum of space around these objects can have three times the density of iron. Think about that. The magnetic field is so strong, just three equals mc squared, the vacuum of empty space has the density of three times iron. He is studying many, many of these objects. And when you think about how small they are, Okay, these are things that are 20 kilometers across. We're seeing it hundreds or thousands of light years away. And he has, uh, he's uh, made an instrument that can actually, of course, not directly image them. They're way too small to actually see. But an X-ray timing mission that can actually show us what's going on on their surfaces. And they're helping us test theories of what goes on, what goes on in their interiors. So these are some of the most exciting, real monsters of the universe. Again, I mean, one thing I'll just add, one more thing before I go on to Keith. The gravity around these objects is so strong, you, you'll see, you see behind them at the same time you see the front of them. Because due to Einstein, gravity bends space and time. So as these things rotate, even though something might rotate all the way to the other side of the star away from us, we can still see it as light bends it around the object. So truly extreme physics being done. So, so with that, I will hand it over to Keith to talk about nicer. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, you really covered a lot of the. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I, I got to geek out a little bit. I, I just, I'm just like, oh. So uh, it, 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 they are really fantastic. I want to thank you for inviting me here. Um, so, so nicer is doing the science with an X-ray telescope, and you can see in the video uh, something that's much faster than real speed. Uh, nicer, this kind of uh, box-like thing that seems to be moving around as the rest of the space station does its stuff. Um, this X-ray telescope is spending 85% of its time slowly tracking neutron stars. And then when something like a solar panel comes in the way or, or something else, we will slew to another target. And a typical ISS orbit will be looking at between two and six celestial objects, neutron stars, black holes, other stars, comets, um, and this, being on the space station gives us a huge amount of flexibility uh, to do this type of planning and get the data down. And that flexibility affords us to have a nicer play a role in a larger community of astrophysicists. Telescopes that are on the ground are in orbit, 
uh, in a typical ISS orbit, the string you see in the lower left goes uh, like three consecutive orbits for nicer. And when it's flying over the east, it's uh, doing observations of something called the Crab Nebula in coordination with radio telescopes in Japan. As we cross the west coast of the US, we slew to look at a really fantastic black hole called GRS 1915. And we're doing those in coordination with optical telescopes in the Canary Islands. And so NICER plays a role in this broader community of providing the X-ray end of a multi wavefront understanding of what's going on in a lot of these objects. And as Michelle mentioned, uh, you know, our primary science is neutron stars. So NICER is the neutron star interior composition explorer. And you know, gravity is so strong that you have to think about things differently. What you see in this picture are hot spots that would be on a neutron star, one in which you have weak gravity and one in which you have strong gravity. And um, stop rotating, but um, the important thing here is in the case of weak gravity, that's more like what we're used to. If you imagine a hot spot, if you imagine a hot spot um, on a ball that's rotating, as that ball faces you, it's bright. And as it goes away from you, it disappears. And so there are a whole class of neutron stars called pulsars, which are just you know, indications of this thing pulsing. And as Michelle mentioned, some of these stars are pulsing or spinning hundreds of times a second. Um, in the case of strong gravity, which is what we have around neutron stars, one to two times the mass of the sun squeezed into something the size of Washington, DC, um, the, uh, uh, the strong gravity actually allows you to see that spot as it's on the other side. And so the effect of that is the shape of the pulse is different. And so NICER was designed to make a really accurate measurement of the shape of these pulses in order to go to the next slide here uh, to make measurements. So we, we use gravitational light bending um, to, to, uh, to, uh, to analyze the data that we get from many, many short observations integrated over years or months uh, of different stars. And so from a couple of years ago, this was our first measurement of the mass and radius of a neutron star with precision that's really been unmatched. So we, we measured the radius of the star uh, uh, it's about 13 kilometers. Um, we also measured the mass of the star. This is an isolated star. And so there's no other way to measure its mass, but we could make the mass measurement with, with NICER's data using this gravitational light bending. One, one of the things that's kind of interesting, so if you look at the picture, um, you know, the picture, the, the animated picture, you see uh, these, you know, this rotating spheres. We had two independent teams do the analysis uh, independently. And as Michelle mentioned, NICER doesn't, even though it's an X-ray telescope, it doesn't really take pictures, it does timing. And, and the cool thing about how we analyze this timing data is we could get a picture that we could never possibly resolve with the best telescope. And we're looking at something that's thousands of light years away. And these hot spots that we see are say the size of you know, the University of Maryland, you know, spinning around the star. And we can actually map the structure. This is the most precise images of the surface of a neutron star. It's not too bad for something that can't image. It's just doing timing or doing physics. So the, the thing about the, the, the weird hot spot configuration we can see is that neutron stars are actually quite a bit different from what we thought they were. Those hot spots indicate where magnetic field lines kind of dive into the neutron star surface that cause the heating. And we found that neutron stars have a really strange magnetic field structure that's different from what we thought. You know, in fact, uh, you know, our logo for the mission is in the upper left, and you can see like a little blue sphere with a little jets popping up. That was the textbook model that we all learned about when we were in graduate school or you know, studying astrophysics. That's what a neutron star looks like. Our data suggests that it looks a little bit different, and one of our graduate students has made a new logo. Uh, that we will produce stickers for at some point in the future to send to you. Um, uh, the other thing that we did with NICER uh, with neutron stars is we did something as a technology demonstration. So um, these pulses that we see from neutron stars is extremely regular. Imagine twice the mass of the sun spinning about hundreds of times a second. It doesn't slow down very much because of angular momentum conservation. And a subclass of these pulsars 
you know, the pulsing is so precise, it's like atomic clocks. And the atomic clocks are the foundation of GPS. In fact, some of these millisecond pulsars we look at are better than atomic clocks. And so we had funding with, from the Space Technology Mission Director at NASA headquarters to do a demonstration of pulsar-based navigation. So it's just, it's GPS, but with an infrastructure that's distributed around the galaxy as opposed to the medium Earth orbit. And early on in the mission, we demonstrated that we could determine the position of the space station 10 kilometers using nothing but pulsar data. Now, 10 kilometers doesn't sound great compared to other navigation techniques, but this 10 kilometer measurement that we got in a very tough orbit around the Earth is something that we can achieve in the outer planets and beyond, where I can guarantee you it's actually much worse to get navigation information. So this is something that really could lead mankind out of the solar system as a navigation tool. And we demonstrated that on the space station. Now we're doing a lot of science, and I just want to end with this thing, uh, this uh, experiment that we're about to do with NICER. Uh, we actually, this week, we had our first astronaut involvement in NICER integration. And that was when Mark Vandehe uh, uh, connected some cables and a laptop computer that were inside the pressure chamber. Because what we're going to do with that is we're going to connect NICER to another payload made by the Japanese called MAXI. MAXI is the monitor all side X ray image. And in one ISS orbit, it has a very wide field of view and it can see the entire, almost the entire sky. While NICER can only look kind of in a little soda straw in one particular direction. And so we do a lot of science where we, we take input from other experiments and we process it on the ground and we send up a new command to NICER to, to look at it. But what we want to do with this experiment, which we call OMAN, which is uh, originally the honor of a hookup of Maxi and NICER, the ISS acronym, please not like that name. So it's the Orbiting High Energy Monitor Alert Network, but it's still OMAN, it's really cool. And what we're going to do is use that laptop computer to read that data from Maxi, look for things that go boom in the night in the X-ray sky. These are thermal nuclear explosions and neutron stars or outbursts from black holes, and then Send that information to NICER so it can automatically scoot to the target and bring orders of magnitude higher sensitivity to do science from those objects. And that's OBAN. That's that actually begins next week. You know, with the astronaut hookup with the cables on, on Tuesday, the, on Monday this week, you know, we're, we're just about ready to do that. So we have a, you know, we're, we're, we have another three years hopefully of operations where we're going to be uh, reap the science from this kind of combination of using two different things on the space station. Um, you know, to do greater science. Thank you very much. So yes, you can maybe pass the clicker down. Uh, well, one thing I'll say is that although these things seem very distant and, and very esoteric, um, they actually do have measurable effects on the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Keith probably knows, which was the year there was the one, there was a neutron star that 50,000 light years away, there was a, a, a tiny little, uh, basically a tiny little earthquake, a centimeter movement of the super dense crust. And it actually uh, caused our, our electric and magnetic field to, to vibrate real, pretty violently and actually significantly blew off a bit of the top of the atmosphere. That was from 50,000 light years away. I forget when that was, but it's a real thing. I mean, these neutron stars are very exciting objects, and we should be thinking about them. They impact our lives. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, bringing things back a little bit closer to our home. Um, the, uh, the Earth science that's done on the space station is also incredibly significant. And we're talking a lot uh, in this uh, in this entire conference about you know our, our climate and how we're measuring it and monitoring it. And uh, there, the um, the idea of lidar of, of bouncing lasers off the Earth from the space station to measure the heights of things has incredible applications. Just just uh, so many different things you can measure. And I'm just going to put a little uh, uh, a little sort of uh, kudos there for the the, uh, the acronyms. I mean, I'm sorry. So, so this is one of the instruments that flew in the past was called CATS. That was the acronym. Uh, the one that's flying now is called Jedi. And the idea that it has CATS and Star Wars Jedi and lasers from space is about as exciting as I can possibly imagine. So uh, this is uh, this is John uh, Yorks from Goddard Space Flight Center, one of our Earth scientists. So John, please uh, please tell us about uh, Earth science on the space station. <laughs> 
Thanks. Yeah, I think our website got a lot of uh, hits from people looking for cats in space. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, as Michelle said, there's a lot of Earth science uh, observations from the ISS, lightning observations, um, uh, stratospheric aerosols like volcanic plumes and uh, ocean wind uh, measurements. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my experience, which is the, the cloud aerosol transport system, as we call CATS, which uh, was a tech demo LIDAR instrument that operated on the space station for 33 months. And it was designed to study uh, clouds and aerosols. So when I say aerosols, dust, smoke, um, some man-made pollution uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on what I view as, as the benefits of the ISS for, for CATS and other earth science um, instruments, and just talk a little bit about the, the measurements from CATS itself. Um, so there's really three big benefits in my mind um, for the, from you know, you, flying an earth science instrument on the ISS. The first is that it's a low cost platform for earth science. Um, you know, when we're talking about things like active remote sensors, like a LIDAR or a radar, these things tend to be uh, more power hungry, larger. Um, and so, you know, they're not really fit for CubeSats. And so being able to basically get a free bus is, is a really big deal. Um, and then, you know, potentially doing a ride share on a, on a uh, resupply mission also saves a lot of money. Um, and, and so this really enables us to do things like technology demonstration. And so CATS is a good example of that. We flew um, detectors and, and other, you know, subcomponents that had never flown in space before. And, and, you know, now they have, and we are building a follow-up instrument for one of the uh, NASA Earth System Observatory missions. Um, that has a lot of heritage from CATS, and we bought down a lot of risk and cost on that instrument because of, um, you know, our ability to do CATS on the space station. Um, and I, I think that, you know, some of the other instruments, um, you know, have similar stories. Um, another thing is the, the comprehensive coverage of the tropics in the mid-latitude. So CATS specifically, is geared towards clouds and aerosols. Um, in this uh, photo that you see here with, with the space station orbit, you'll see um, there's some, some green colors. That's uh, you know, smoke uh, from, from the um, GMAO uh, model uh, at NASA Goddard. The, the orange colors are, are dust. Um, and so you can see those blue arrows are kind of showing where the uh, aerosols get get transported. Um, and so those, those key transport tracks and, and aerosol uh, emission sources are all in the uh, orbit domain of the ISS. Um, very similar story for clouds. Um, a lot of the high clouds that are important for our, our uh, energy balance on Earth, um, these are uh, most frequent in the tropics and mid-latitudes. So, this orbit was really well situated for the CATS instrument. Um, and, and, you know, other instruments like JEDI, which is measuring vegetation, another ladder instrument on the space station. Again, another really important, uh, you, know, um, you know, use of the orbit because a lot of the, the vegetation, the forests and tropical rainforests are in uh, the domain of the ISS orbit. Um, and so the, the third thing is monitoring hazardous events in real time. Um, and so a big advantage of the ISS, especially compared to some of our more historical earth science instruments that you know, launched in the early 2000s is, is we can get the data down in, in real time in seconds. And that really allows us to monitor things like uh, fires, smoke from the fires, uh, air pollution and air quality uh, events. Um, and, and so just to give an example, this is a video showing the cats actually passing over. We happen to pass right over a small smoke, a uh, small fire in Oregon. And you can actually see the plume 
coming off of Oregon. So this is a modus image right now. You can see in red, those are the fires and you can see sort of the, the grayish colors near the fires, that's the smoke plume. And as you see here, as Katz goes over, we're gonna see the, the vertical dimension of those fires. So you see those light blue and, and yellow and green colors. That's the actual smoke plume coming off that mountain. And there's light blue colors there. That's the transported smoke that affects air quality downwind from the fires. Um, and, and so, you know, air quality is one of those things that in the Earth Science Decadal Survey uh, was deemed most important. So, so there's a lot of really good applications for air quality uh, on the ISS. And I think, you know, as we look forward now um, with we still have potentially seven years on the ISS. I think there's a, a lot we can do still um, with, uh, with, with earth science measurements, uh, technology demonstration for future decadal survey missions, maybe even technology demonstrations for the new uh, generation of uh, space stations uh, going forward, um, you know, to, to, to drive down some of the potential risk and costs there. Um, and, and the other thing I, I think is worth pointing out, uh, you know, because it, the ISS is kind of a, uh, an inexpensive platform, a lot of the instruments have tended to be class D and um, besides just the technology demonstration, there's a lot of opportunities for early career, mid-career scientists and engineers to work on those projects and take larger roles on those projects. I'm kind of an example of that. I was the science lead for CATS and um, I gained invaluable experience. Um, and, and now uh, because of that experience, I'm deputy project scientist on, on one of the NASA um, Earth uh, System Observatory missions. And so I, I imagine there's a lot more stories like that, but obviously these missions, everything you know that we're here talking about uh, you know, people are a huge part of that and training next generation uh, is, is certainly an important thing that, you know, sometimes we kind of, uh, we get so caught up in the technology and the science, we kind of forget about that aspect of, of all of these missions and, and wonderful things we're doing. Um, so just something else I thought I'd point out. Um, that's all I really had to say. So you've heard about some of the really exciting science, you know, from the, the, the medical and uh, uh, deep astrophysics to earth science and climate studies, air pollution, and there's a whole lot more that was mentioned. You know, one, of the, uh, one of the experiments I've been really excited about was this cold atom facility, just producing uh, uh, something called Bose-Einstein condensate, where what matter does at extremely low temperatures, billions of a degree above absolute zero. So you know, using the ISS as a uh, laboratory for fundamental physics, you know, all, all throughout the universe is something I think a lot of people don't think about. So uh, we have a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, if anybody would like to like, see we have one up there. Hi, thanks for the presentation uh, for Keith. Um, for the 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 pulse that uh, came from a neutron star fifty thousand light years away, presumably that came a long time ago. So, do we get any advance notice, uh, or is it the light coming in at the same time as the pulse? And what is the the effect of the the problems on the magnetic field? That 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 uh, what's the practical uh, you know problems that can come from that? Uh, it wasn't that long ago. I forget exactly how long ago. Well, 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 the actual event was about 10 years ago, but I, I think he's saying it traveled 50,000 light years. Oh. And so, was, was there any uh, advanced warning? <laughs> right, right. So, there is no advanced warning because you know, that stuff is coming to you at the speed of light. And you know, that is a limit. Um, so, yeah, we, we know it when it happens. There's a lot of interesting transients out there, a lot of magnetars. Particular, they do a lot of really interesting. They kind of spontaneously disperse, and so NICE is always on the lookout for data to indicate, hey, we should be looking at that guy because it's doing something. You know, maybe this time it'll be like that gigantic burst that happened ten years ago. We'll find something more about that system. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And actually, to give you an example of this, it was, uh, we had a press release, I believe, about two weeks ago, that there were three hot spots on the neutron star, and then they merged. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so, you know, the hot spots that are on the surfaces of neutron stars that the image are primarily formed by these magnetic fields kind of merging together, causing heating on the surface of the star. And in the case of magnetic stars, magnetic field structure is changing quite a bit. And so uh, there's a press release we put out last week, um, data that we took last year that talks about uh, how dynamic some of these magnetic uh, magnet stars really are and how some of these structures can change so quickly. Um, they're really interesting objects and they, they change dramatically and unpredictably. And that hot spots merge and have them break apart. And it's a, a very interesting dynamic. You have a few more questions up, up there. Then we'll definitely see Aki there. I was just wondering, have we had the good luck to actually see a uh, neutron star forming and be able to try to validate the theories of how uh, that actually happens in detail? So maybe. Um, in 2018, there was something called AT 18 COW. It's an optical transmit uh, detected by a whole swarm of round telescopes. The cyber things that change. Uh, NICER was one of many missions that swerved to look at that based on the triggers we got from round uh, round observatories. In that particular case, we just published a paper last year where we were looking carefully at the data and. We know that this was a supernova explosion, but we've never seen um, direct evidence that pulsars are happening right after this explosion. We made a marginal detection of pulsations from that system, which would suggest the birth of a neutron star. And uh, you know, it, it's. I wish we had more time on it. You know, it's kind of a fleeting thing, and. and Detailed analysis takes a bit more time. So I'm hoping we're going to get lucky again. Fortunately, there's a large number of these observatories doing this type of science and producing you know, this data that observatories like NICE can follow up on. So I think we'll have another chance, most likely. This is something that goes into that multi messenger astrophysics that we were talking about before. Uh, some of these events also have coordinating gravitational wave observations. And then there are follow ups by the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, the James Webb in the future. So there's a lot of these different. Data sets coming together. Um, we had another. Is it Susan? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could um, let us know if there are any particular times that it's best to see the ISS. I've only seen it a few times, and I was out in the country. There's so much light pollution around this area that it's very difficult to get a good view of it. For certain times of the year or certain places we should be. I don't know about the app. Yeah. Does anybody want to say about that? I mean, so um, I, I, there, there actually is a there, there actually is an app on your smartphone that will, will tell you when the space station is viewable in your area. So I, I would search on the app store, you know, ISS, you know, what when can I see ISS? I actually probably know the name of that app. I do have it. But uh, it, it's so much brighter than other things in the sky to pass it. So I, I've been able to view it easily from my home. Yeah, and I would just I would just say it, it goes fast. So make sure you're out there a few minutes before it's expected, or you may miss it. So. <laughs> so I saw a question. I saw a question from Aki. Oh, we go to the list first. Yeah. Okay. And, and this gentleman here. Make sure we yeah. Um, I think this question is maybe for Ray or maybe John. Um, can you compare pros and cons of ISS as a tech demonstration platform compared to, say, CubeSat sounding rockets? Balloons. Sure. Um, so, my, my experience is with uh, larger uh, active remote sensing instruments. And, and really, in my mind, there's no better way to demonstrate technology than the ISS um, for those types of payloads. Um, you know, it, it, with how much power and volume they tend to need, you know, you're, you're talking bigger small sat type of, you know, sensors. So um, it, it kind of makes it hard to do that 
technology demonstration, technology demonstration using other platforms. Um, you know, I'll leave you know the leave it to you to talk about the other aspects. Of and I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, CubeSats are really, really subscale kind of experiments. And most of the time, if you're trying to, what you're really trying to do in research is go from a lab to something, you know, they cross, call, uh, call crossing the valley of death, which is how do you scale it up so you can do something with it. And I think um, it's good for doing like the basic or fundamental research at the CubeSat level, but you need more scale to be able to really demonstrate technology. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we just had a panel on ISS, Leo, uh, economy, transition, all of that. Um, how is uh, the science community prepared for that transition or, or in, in your mind, should be preparing for that? And what kind of expectations do you have from those providers for engaging you as stakeholders? So um, <clears throat> I don't know that I have the right answer to this, but um, clearly the um, science community, our user advisory committee is very interested in what's going on with commercial Leo destination. Um, most of the, you know, most of the commercial Leo providers, I believe, are looking more at tech demo um, in space production kinds of activities. So fundamental or basic research is probably going to still be the um, domain of the federal governments. So my guess is NASA and other federal agencies will invest in facilities to do that kind of work. Um, hopefully, um, the commercial Leo um, uh, economy is growing at a rate where you know you'll see more commercial facilities made available for any space production and you know um, uh, things like that, you know commercialization. So uh, I'd say it's um, it's an area of interest, probably also an area of concern to the research community. Um, but I think uh, over the next couple of years, uh, we'll probably bring more form to that, and you know we'll, we'll develop a coherent program on how to continue to do the things we're doing. So I, I kind of think of the space station as a giant homeowners association, kind of where you, you're getting new payloads that show up from time to time, and you're wondering if they're going to have teenagers that play loud music or whatever, right? Uh, you know, so there are a lot of new things going up on space station, and and I, I wish there's a little bit better communication, quite frankly, between those efforts and kind of like existing science here on the space station. There are things that are being added, like the iRose of solar panels. And I, I found out about the iRose of solar panels by doing space suits. You know, and the thing about it, the iRose of solar panels are a potential blockage for my science instrument. So if somebody didn't connect the dots between that and telling the research community that this is happening. And likewise, there are new things where they're talking about solar power towers that can severely impact experiments that look out. And even experiments that look down like Earth-based experiments where you need star trackers to get an attitude so that the LIDAR is pointed in the right direction. If you have a big solar panel blocking your star tracker, you would validate all of that science. And so there are places like this that you need to good communication. So like any homeowners association, I think you have to be active in it. Everybody has to be active in it. And then, and then you know, people need to communicate this information so that you know things work more harmoniously. So I'll uh, add a an earth science. I think that was a good perspective, and I'll, I'll add a little bit more from an earth science perspective. Um, our, a lot of our historical missions have been in a polar sun synchronous orbit, um, and of course, when you're talking about climate and you have long-term changes, it's important to keep those data records going, right? Um, so a lot of earth science focus tends to be on those polar sun synchronous orbits. But of course, there's a lot of really good science that can also be done in the in inclined orbits with ISS, with the future space stations, um, small sets, cube sets. 
So I think from an earth science perspective, there's there's a bit of a, uh, you know, I don't want to say crossroads because uh, it makes it sound like maybe we shouldn't be going down the same road, but I think we should to continue, you know, some of those data records. But I think there's another road now and we should be taking both those roads. And um, I think we've just been a little slow, maybe slower to do that than maybe some of the other uh, science disciplines. I don't know. Can you, can you, can you, sorry. In the interest of making sure we have time for our speaker coming after us, we have time for one last question. I know this gentleman's been waiting, so there'll be time hopefully uh, during breaks you can approach the speakers to ask questions. I apologize for the voice that Thank, thank you. And, uh, I always love hearing about the science on the space station. You know, this is why we built, and especially it's why the National Lab has designated to make sure this happens. And sort of following on my question in the previous panel, which by the way, I, when I saw them sitting there, I thought of HOA. I thought that's what they represented. It. But, you know, my, my question is, now that we've extended again to 2030, um, what's, what's the impact on the discussions and consideration of transitioning the national lab entities into that, that new era when there's no longer a NASA's own facility? On which the national lab is part of the US segment of the total national or the total national space station. So, are those conversations going on? Are you comfortable with them? I assume it's a different point. What's the point of those? And we have a panel, so it's focused on you. <laughs> so, um, so, I don't want to speak for NASA completely. I can just tell you the conversations I've had. So, we're having regular dialogue with uh, with NASA and the program. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but there's several studies going on um, at NASA. I think Bobby Law is, is running a study and um, Robin Gatins has uh, organized this group of experts. And so the intent is to try to build on what we've done in the national lab um, going forward. So I've been pretty much assured it may not be called the ISS NL, but there will be some kind of Leo um, National Lab going forward. And I think the intent is, you know, we've got roughly 10 years to go, and we potentially have a, um, I, I believe we will have a uh, commercial Leo destination Axioms planning to fly here in a couple of years, which gives us an, a unique opportunity of trying to understand how does the business model change from a government, a fully government owned facility to something which I, I'm going to characterize as, you know, um, commercially owned, commercially operated, but uh, partially government funded um, lab. And how do we operate in that model to make sure that we're providing enough access? to do basic or fundamental research and continue to do um, you know, the development of this commercial Leo economy. So conversations are going on. I believe we're more in the data collection phase right now. I'm expecting that there'll probably be some kind of a modification to our cooperative agreement that enable um, kind of transitioning into that model so that when the ISS is retired, we have a you know a more functioning national lab um, than what we did when we started ten years ago. Um, you know, it's been a bit of an experiment. I don't know if people really fully understand that. You know, this is the first time uh, of doing a national lab uh, in space. First off, and then secondly, um, you know, it's really kind of a cooperation between us and NASA on uh, use of the station for. Uh, research. So yeah, I, the conversations are ongoing. I think you're going to hear more and more about it over the next uh, couple of years. And then clearly um, the axiom of you know, commercial real destination kind of you know, starts us down that path of a more commercial uh, operation in space. So, yeah. Michelle, Ray, John. Yes, I don't, I don't. Keith. Have to go into our next speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah. Not so much.